Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Star Wars Acolyte Episode 4 video. There are a bunch of Easter eggs references. We finally got a reveal on that Sith Master, or who seems like the Sith Master. There's a lot of questions as to whether or not this is just the real apprentice and the actual Sith Master is someone else that we'll meet later. That's always possible, but I think the episode gave us enough clues to figure out who this person actually is underneath that mask, like the Darth Teeth of it all. A couple of the weaknesses of the episode are the way they sort of set things up and how they're going to explain the plot hole with the Sith not being around for a thousand years, that Phantom Menace line. I'll explain later in the video, but there are like a couple key people involved in that scene in present day in the Phantom Menace that create some problems for them during this part of the timeline. So it remains to be seen if Acolyte will be ultimately successful as a series in paying that off in a way that doesn't feel like it's bending over backwards too much. That might wind up being the downfall of the series if they're not actually able to explain that in a satisfying way. Generally, the episode was way better than number three, but overall, the series in general has been kind of a weak start. So hopefully they're hiding some bangers in the back half of the season, or ultimately, I think people will be disappointed in the series. If you're brand new to the channel, we're doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. The episode was titled Day. I think what they'll do here is like the next episode will be night. It'll be like day and night because they have this whole juxtaposition where like the first couple of episodes had a dual title for May and Osha. There's this whole metaphor of the eclipse, like the Jedi being eclipsed by the Sith. Also that dual eclipse that you saw in the background during the ascension in the flashbacks in last week's episode. So early theory, next week's episode will just be night to the day of this episode. Like night has fallen, as in the Sith are beginning to rise, like we're starting to see more of the Sith-based plot, which has been one of the big complaints of the series so far, is that originally this series was pitched as sort of like a Sith-leaning series, but they haven't really got into that much Sith-based stuff. Like the Force Witches technically are not Sith, that's like a whole separate thing. So it kind of seems like the actual Sith during the plot we'll see more during the second half of the season, just based on the progression here so far. The actual opening scene is of Kelnaka on Kofar, his home that he's made from the wreckage of what seems like this downed ship here. It's not clear if it's his ship that just crashed or if it's a ship that he found that had already crashed there and he just took up residence there. Because the locals, they find out later, say that he just marched into the jungle and disappeared about a year ago. Which would imply that the ship has been there for a lot longer and it looks like it's been there for a very long time. Notice all the symbols that he's drawn on the wall. They look kind of like yin yang drawings. In the context of the Star Wars universe, it'd be more like the relationship between the dark side and the light side orbiting around each other, like the two sides of the same coin kind of thing. But notice the symbols are also similar to the spiral symbol of the Force Witches that May got imprinted on her forehead during the Ascension Ceremony. Like that's the mark on May's forehead. Back on Coruscant at the Jedi Temple, Jeki continues her training classes, studying lightsaber combat with another Jedi Master. They're just calling him Master Lakshay in the credits. He's not anybody from the pre-existing canon, so they created him for this episode. If you're fans of Avatar The Last Airbender, the actual combat that he's trying to teach them, like the actual lightsaber lesson, sounds very airbender-like in that he's trying to teach them to optimize their defenses, like a more defense-based fighting style. The whole idea with airbenders is that it's not a very aggressive bending style. They are capable of attacking people, but most of them do not. May also talks about this with Chimere, like her whole mission to try and get the Jedi to abandon their principles and attack her while she's unarmed. They also talked about it in earlier episodes too, like a Jedi will not pull their weapon, their lightsaber, unless they intend to use it to kill. That's also based on the real life principle that a police officer won't pull their gun or like a military personnel like won't pull their gun unless they intend to actually use it. Because this is a very anti-Jedi kind of series, like it's Sith leaning so they're positioning the Jedi is more the antagonist. They're treating them like corrupt space cops basically. But also when he's talking about them making minimal strikes, no strikes at all in some cases, it's also a callback to Indara's kung fu fighting style in episode 1 where she went all crouching tiger hidden dragon on Mei dodging her attacks when she was trying to grab Indara's lightsaber. Osha tries to say her goodbyes to her, they have a pretty good relationship like we'll meet up again we'll tell funny stories about Soul sometime. At this point she still seems very pro Jedi, like she's thankful to them for helping clear her name. She's really upset about her sister still, even though Soul tries to talk her around later in the episode. But she at least claims here that she's passing off the duty of going after her sister to the Jedi, like it's the Jedi's problem, I'm not going to deal with it, it's too painful. Separately, May and Kamir go to Kofar, he's still acting like the fool, tripping over the baggage. Like I said in earlier episodes, like when we saw him in episode 2, it seems like a lot of what he does here is way over the top on purpose, like he's leaning into the fool persona because he's using it as a defense mechanism to disarm people. 
He also claims that he braved the forest to find Kelnaka in the first place. Like, he knows where Kelnaka is and is serving as her guide. And the forest is supposed to be so dangerous, so terrifying, that bounty hunters don't even want to go into it. So essentially, it means that he's fearless and has crazy tracking skills. More evidence that he's the mystery Sith Lord Darth Teeth, whatever we want to call him. Remember during episode two, after playing the fool, he also quickly and easily disarmed Mei, who'd already killed a couple of Jedi. So she has skills and he disarmed her in a second flat. There are a couple of times during their conversations too, where his voice changes intonation and he goes from acting the fool to a really serious tone all of a sudden. And a lot of the things that he says to her are things that the Sith Lord said during episode one. Back at the Jedi Council, another group of Jedi Masters and other Jedi is with Sol examining the footage of their fight with Mei. Notice how nobody in this meeting mentions the word Sith. Initially, they think she might be part of a splinter order, but when she says something worse, quote unquote, like she might be part of something worse, I think she's implying Sith. Or at least a dark side order of non-Sith. Not all dark side practitioners were Sith. Like there were people out there that would practice the dark side of the Force. Vernestra Rowe shows up and they mention the Jedi High Council. That's the council most people are talking about when they mention the Jedi Council. For instance, Yoda is the current Grand Master during this part of the timeline. Because he's so long lived, he just continues being the Grand Master of the High Council into the events of Phantom Menace. She also explains why they're not going to inform them or inform Yoda of what's going on here with Mei, this potential Sith character, this Sith Master that they're looking for. They're really more interested in the Sith Master than in Mei. The logic the show is going with is that if they learn about a phantom menace of a Sith out there somewhere, make all the puns you want to. That's a big enough threat that protocol would dictate they'd have to inform the Senate of what's going on. They're worried about political enemies of the Jedi eroding their authority in the Republic, eroding faith in the Jedi just in general. They never really explain specifically who these political enemies they're talking about are, but I think this is all part of the Sith's grand long-term plan to basically destroy the Jedi Order that just culminates eventually in Order 66 many, many years later. And a lot of that, I think, gets into what Chimere is talking about in this episode and also the Sith Master during Episode 1. But like I said, I think the Chimere is the Sith Master. And the whole idea is getting people around the galaxy just in general to stop having faith in the Jedi. So part of the idea is that Vernestra Rowe tells Sol, no, we cannot inform the High Council. They're trying to, quote unquote, cover this up, like very hush-hush. I think it's a way to seed the idea in present day during the Phantom Menace, if we're talking about present day, how that Jedi Council can be surprised when Qui-Gon Jinn shows up talking about Darth Maul in the Sith, and they think that he's crazy. Like, Sith, what? They've been gone for a thousand years. Maybe that's because the Jedi here, like the lower ranking Jedi, just covered everything up. But here's the thing, too. There are probably going to be a thousand comments about this. In this same meeting, you actually see the Jedi Master Holden here talking to Kia Adit Mundi, who is on the Jedi Council in Phantom Menace and is the one who actually says the Sith had not been around for a thousand years. An apprentice who doesn't know their master. It's absurd. My only conclusion can be that it was a Sith Lord. Impossible. The Sith have been extinct for a millennium. So if he himself was in this meeting where they're discussing, quote unquote, a phantom menace, the only way to explain this plot hole is if he himself does not believe that they're talking about Sith in this conversation, in the fact that nobody actually mentions Sith out loud. And after the series is done, all the Jedi who are on the mission don't come back and tell him about the Sith Lord. There are only a couple ways to explain it. Like, we're really bending over backwards to try and explain this. Like, do they get their mind wiped? Because in an earlier episode, Chimere does sort of raise that point when he tells the Jedi, please don't use your mind wipe powers on me. That might be the show seeding the idea that Chimere, as the Sith Master, has the ability to affect people's mind, like wipe people's memories using Sith techniques. That's the only way you can explain all these Jedi not dying here if they don't get killed, if a couple survive, and make it back to the Jedi Temple without telling everybody about what happened with a quote-unquote Sith Master. So we're talking about a combination of like the world's biggest cover-up at the lower levels of the Jedi, a couple of them being completely oblivious to what's going on like Kia Adamundi, who winds up being on the Council himself and claiming that the Sith haven't been around for a thousand years. It may be some mind wiping somewhere in there and a lot of them being killed. Like clearly a lot of them are going to be killed during this big fight scene here at some point. Some of them will probably survive though. Speaking of cameo scenes, a lot of people wondering if this is Plo Koon later in the episode because we saw him in all the trailers. They confirmed after the fact, Lucasfilm confirmed that it is not Plo Koon. It's just another member of his race. 
Also, here's the thing too. When Sol says there's no way anyone could have survived the fall 16 years ago because Vernestra Rose like, why didn't you catch May? Why didn't you tell me about May? Because he says he's absolutely sure at the time that she died. Like nobody could survive that. It's possible that either Chimere or Chimere's master at that time was around 16 years ago. Maybe that Sith master was orchestrating events then and is the one to also have saved May. We'll probably see more flashbacks to 16 years ago because there's some trailer footage with the characters that we did not see during the episodes yet. There are just too many conveniences, questions, unexplained things during that flashback that we got in episode 3. So it's totally possible that there was a mystery Sith master sitting behind the scenes there pulling strings. Based on Chimere's age though, that's why I say that it might have been Chimere's Sith master. Also notice when Sol is talking to Vernestra Rowe about May's master, they don't mention the word Sith. They just talk about her quote unquote master. When she starts suggesting that this might be part of a larger plan, tipping the scales, is probably part of the Sith's long-term plan, like I said, to destroy the Jedi. And one of the early phases of the plan here is to erode confidence in the Jedi around the galaxy, get people to stop believing in the Jedi. Also getting a lot of the Jedi to stop believing in the Jedi Order itself. Really easy way to take down the Jedi Order is to get a bunch of the Jedi to quit the Order. Back on Kofar, Kamir keeps talking about May's quest to kill the Jedi without a weapon. Notice how he avoids a lot of her questions about the Master when she asks him, how did you meet him? Have you seen his face? Notice the look on his face when he's avoiding her questions. There are a couple moments where he gets really serious briefly, then jumps back to being a fool. He also references the same concept that the Jedi were also just talking about, shifting the scales, getting people around the galaxy and the Republic to stop believing in the Jedi, destroy faith in the Jedi, destroy the Jedi's faith in the Jedi Order itself. Which is also what the Sith Master told her in Episode 1. Destroy the dream. So just more and more evidence building that he is that mystery Sith Master underneath the helmet. Sol gets Osha before she takes off to help find Mei. Notice she seems kind of bummed when she realizes he's not asking her to rejoin the Jedi Order. Like at this point in time, she still believes in the Jedi Order and she wants to be a Jedi, but feels like she can't because she can't overcome her past trauma. But she does tell him during the episode that her Jedi skills are slowly coming back. Like I can start feeling things again now. So pretty soon her abilities will start coming back more and more. It's a very Grogu type of phenomenon during the Mandalorian where he spent all those years hiding from the Emperor and Darth Vader, the Inquisitors, by basically shielding himself from the Force itself. But in all that time, not using his abilities caused them to wane. So it just took him a while to train himself up again. Osha meets that new tracker character, Basil. He's a character they created for the show. He's a Tynan tracker. They're an aquatic race. He looks kind of like a beaver crossed with a badger. She has a weird joke about not being sure whether it's male or female, but later Yord is like, no, that's a dude. And even though Yord is a super big dick to her, he does seem like he cares about her. Remember, he's meant to be kind of like a Cyril Karn kind of personality, like very, very uptight, very high strung. When he mentions Shri Wook, that's the language of the Wookiees. Osha then basically asks him to kill Mei if it comes to a fight because she doesn't think she'll be able to do it. She hesitated last time. She doesn't want to hesitate again. He implies Sol brought her along as a test to prove to herself that she still has it in her to be a good Jedi, like you can actually do this. Later, Sol also kind of has the same conversation with her where he says that this whole adventure is a test for both of them to overcome their past trauma. Then the whole vibe of everybody, both groups entering the forest, both Mei and Chimere and then the Jedi separately, is a lot like the vibe of Luke Skywalker entering the cave on Dagobah, or like the cave during Last Jedi, the rotten forest that they reference. Seems like it's very strong in the dark side of the forest. Notice how the music shifts too. They pass those giant bugs, Chekhov's bugs, they're gonna go off at some point pretty soon. We see one during this episode come for them, which Sol takes down pretty quickly. But I think the reason for showing a bunch of them there is because we'll see a bunch of them either in next week's episode or after that at some point. Like they wouldn't show you all these bugs that they weren't going to go off and come for them pretty soon. They learn the bugs are attracted to the light. This is key for what happens at the end of the episode too. Like they're attracted to the energy and the light from the lightsabers, meaning that the Jedi can't whip them all out and just use them as freely or risk bringing a ton of them down on them, which kind of happens at the end of the episode. Like everybody whips out their lightsaber, meaning that it's going to wake up all these bugs and they're all going to come rushing to this area. Notice how Osha also mourns the loss of the bug. Like I'm sad that I disturbed it and got it killed. When Jackie tries to make her feel better by talking about death, she mentions things or people transforming into the Force. The whole concept of death in the Star Wars universe is that essentially when you die, your body, like your energy, your life force becomes one with the Force again. The whole idea of Force ghosts is sort of like the extension of that. Jedi don't learn to become Force ghosts till like much later in the timeline. 
The idea of becoming a force ghost, though, is that when you basically transition to that form, like you become one with the force again, literally, is that you're able to retain your consciousness. That's why pretty much all Jedi, Jedi Masters, just in general, aren't afraid of dying. Like, oh, if I die, it's just like the next state of being alive. Like, my consciousness potentially could still be alive in the Force, even though there's only a couple people that learn how to become actual Force ghosts. Because we're talking about a Sith series, Sith can also preserve themselves after death. Like, I mean, not talking about all the crazy Palpatine new Star Wars trilogy stuff. Like, forget all that stuff. If you're talking about Knights of the Old Republic, like original Sith lore, the whole idea is that they can trap their life essence in objects like Sith holocrons, but it's not the same thing as becoming a force ghost. It's basically like them attaching their life force to an object. Notice how Kymir tries to keep May at a runner's pace to get to Kalnaka super quick. I think this is because, quote unquote, like if we're thinking that he's the Sith Master here, I think the idea is that he wants to get her to Kelnaka before the Jedi catch up with them because he can sense the Jedi coming for them and he wants her to be able to complete her task. In the minute that they show up, that's all over. May also explains a little more context for what the actual mission given to her was. She calls it the final test. Like the master called it the final test. And the idea is that the real final test is to get a Jedi to act totally counter to their fundamental beliefs. Like basically go against their fundamental beliefs, abandoning their beliefs. That was what the Sith Master was talking about when he said kill the dream. Basically kill the Jedi's belief in the Jedi Order. Get them to abandon their faith. And the idea is that one of the core tenets of the Jedi Order is that they never attack an unarmed person. So she wants to get a Jedi to attack her while she's unarmed. And that would be them abandoning their faith. Also, backdoor too, she needs a lightsaber so she can get a lightsaber crystal and bleed it red because that's the way the Sith create their lightsabers. So she's completing the final test. If she's successful, after the final test, she would become the apprentice. But like the actual last step of becoming a Sith apprentice would be constructing her own Sith lightsaber. In order to do that, she needed a crystal. So you kind of see the logic of her fetch quest here going around to all the different Jedi. When she keeps reiterating the idea of this being impossible, that just reminded me of Luke Skywalker's talk with Yoda, but just twist flipped on its head because we're talking about Sith stuff here. When he replied, do or do not, there is no try. But Chimer, to his credit, does not say that. I think that would have been a little too hammy, like, no, no, too much, too many references. She also reveals that if she doesn't succeed with Kelnaka here past the test, then the Sith Master will kill her, which is a very Sith thing to do. If your apprentice fails your basic task that you gave them, kill them and just go find a better apprentice. Palpatine burned through multiple apprentices, no problem. Darth Maul, Count Dooku, then Anakin Skywalker. Notice Chimera runs off with a bag full of stuff. What's in that bag? Like, why does he need to carry around that giant bag with him if it doesn't have a bunch of Sith armor in his helmet in it? Maybe he got a little red lightsaber in that bag too. Chimera also then gets caught in the trap. I think it might be on purpose, like he's still playing the fool here. She claims she plans to turn herself into Kelnaka then in the Jedi and they won't throw her in prison because she wants to get to her sister like, oh, my sister's alive. That changes everything. I don't care about being a Sith now anymore. I'll just inform them about the Sith Master's presence. The Sith are back and they'll care way more about that and they won't throw me in prison. And notice how Chimera gets really serious really fast saying he will kill you basically before she's able to inform on him. I think because he is the Sith Master like I will kill you before you can actually pull this off. Then it seems like Soul on the other side of the jungle starts to sense the Sith Master because he pauses like you get this really ominous music. The dark side of the force seems like it's growing in strength around this area. Basil runs into May alerting the Jedi and then she finds Keldaka has already been killed by the Sith Master with his lightsaber. You can see the lightsaber injury on him. There's a bit of a question about the time jump here. Like there's a little missing time. So you're kind of wondering what happened to Chimere? Is he still hanging upside down or did he put on the armor and then rush off and kill Kelnaka before she showed up? Early theory is that he did do that. Like he got his Sith gear on, killed Kelnaka quickly before she showed up so that she couldn't inform on him. The Jedi post up around that ship calling her out just as the Sith Master floats down in the air in his helmet and cloak. He raises his lightsaber to Osha, also preparing to fight the Jedi, igniting their lightsabers. There's a force push to get her out of the way, Osha, while May is still sort of hiding inside the wreckage of that ship watching everything. They start their fight as a slam to black, so the actual fight itself will take place during Episode 5. Now here's the thing, we do get a brief look at the Sith Master from behind. Notice he's wearing some kind of metal band around his arm, probably a Sith artifact enhancing his power. Sith, like I said, could enhance objects with the dark side of the Force. Cranking the brightness up, zoom and enhance, the skin looks like the same shade as Chimere's skin, which is why I still think that it's him. Because remember, Darth Teeth, like the visage of the teeth, the fool, the smile, you're talking about Chimere playing the fool. 
It just seems like the helmet flows thematically with the whole idea that he pretends to be a fool. But it is always possible, like I said, that he is the real Sith apprentice and there's an even stronger Sith master out there somewhere. But let me know in the comments, who do you think is underneath this helmet? It just seems like there's mounting evidence that it is Chimer. Like they really want you to think that it's Chimer. The weird thing about this is some reviewers saw this episode early and said that it would be controversial, but I didn't really find anything particularly controversial during this. Maybe they were referring to the evidence that Chimer might be the Sith Master. Generally, since we're halfway through the season, I'll say this episode definitely better than episode three, one of the stronger episodes that we've had so far, but it's still not quite as good as some of the other Star Wars series. We'll see if they can pick things up in the back half of the season, just because really looking forward to some more actual Sith-based plot, and that seems where, where that's going to be happening in the back half. If there's any other Easter eggs or references that you guys spotted that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. My full episode five video will post next week after they release it. And real big reminder, the boys season four episodes are happening now. My episode video for that will post tomorrow. And we have House of the Dragon season two episodes. Everybody click here for my House of the Dragon season two episode one video and click here for my boys season four episode one video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.